I'm going to give a talk on bicuspid aortic valve disease, and this will dovetail a little bit with some of the later talks in this session about lifetime management and surgical management and management of aortopathy. And I will try not to uh, steal anyone's thunder. But um, so I'm going to start with a question we get as uh, structural interventionalists frequently, I mean nearly weekly, um, which is, can you really do a tavern by cuspid aortic valve disease? Are you guys some sort of cowboys that are doing all sorts of off-label things for patients that really aren't indicated? The, the answer to this question, can you do a tavern by, by cuspid aortic valve disease, is em emphatically yes. Um, this, is, this is approved. You know, Sapiens and Evolutes, um, now Navators, are, are approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for all surgical risk patients regardless of valve anatomy. There used to be a precaution labeling um, in the FDA approval for, for bicuspid valves, but that's actually now been removed. So we are, we are not somewhere out in left field doing cowboy things when we're doing uh, TAVRs and bicuspid valve disease. Um, the reason is because TAVRs perform very well in uh, modern TAVR performs very well in bicuspid anatomy. There was initially questions about that in older, more limited retrospective data, predominantly using first and genera second generation devices. Um, there was suggestion that TAVR and bicuspid disease could lead to higher rates of conversion to open surgery, higher rates of stroke, higher rates of annular rupture, um, more paravalvular leak, more pacemaker implants. And there have been studies, again, most of these are observational retrospective studies that have shown each of those things. However, modern TAVR performs very well in bicuspid anatomy. Um, data from the PARTNER-3, which was a, a low-risk trial, balloon expandable valve, uh, which had a dedicated registry for bicuspid patients, um, shows that bicuspid compared to trileafleted valves who got TAVR, there was no difference in death, no difference in stroke, rehospitalization, pacemaker implant, or PVL. And that's what all of these uh, very m minute Kaplan-Meier curves show. Um, and that's, that's um, you know, partner three. This came out, this was published in 2022. So this is ta TAVR in a modern era using a modern device. Same thing has been also shown with self-expanding valves. Uh, STS TVT registry publication of modern use of self-expanding valves has shown the exact same thing. Bicuspid versus trileaflet anatomy, there's no difference in death, stroke, pacemakers, maybe modestly more uh, paravalvular leak, which you see on that uh, bar graph on the right, 2.2% versus 1.5% moderate or greater paravalvular leak. So this is something we can do. This is something we can do well. Um, it does, however, uh, take a little bit of extra planning to figure out who we should be doing this in. So when we, when we look, and I'm going to transition into looking at specific bicuspid valves and anatomy that, that does well, I say beyond aortopathy and age at the top of the slide because honestly, that, that we'll, we're going to address later in this uh, session. And truly, the first thing when someone refers us a bicuspid patient for TAVR, literally the first thing you ask are how old are they and what does their aorta look like? So I'm not suggesting in any way that some of these other factors are more important than that. But um, we'll, we will talk a bit more about age and some of the life planning uh, aspects and some of the, the intricacies of aortopathy management uh, later. So I like to start with what has been well described as the just natural disease process of aortic valves. What we do with them naturally follows from the natural disease process of a bicuspid valve. They are clearly more calcified. Additionally, the calcium, and we see this on vincent CTs daily is more eccentric and asymmetrical. Um, at times clustered in more bulky chunks. It's not evenly distributed. Um, bicuspid valves are bigger. We, uh, so sizing for TAVR can be tricky. Occasionally you find ones that are just too big for a TAVR valve. Um, the shape of the aortic valve complex, meaning the annulus relationship to the leaflet tips, relationship to the sinuses, relationship to the STJ, are much more um, irregular. So two-thirds of bicuspid valves 
will not be uh, tubular in shape. They have a flared shape or a tapered shape. People talk about a funnel and a cone and, you know, we can get into all kinds of shapes. Um, coronary anomalies are more frequent. And so we have to really be aware of that as we're, as we're planning for TAVR. Um, so when we're, and I'll, I'll not hiding anything here, I'm gonna bring the whole slide up. But when we're planning for bicuspid aortic valve therapy, um, first of all, similar to just thinking about age and aortopathy, all the fundamentals here still apply. If the patient is high or prohibitive surgical risk, they're probably gonna go to TAVR. That's what, I mean, that's what I sort of mean by fundamentals still applying. If the annular dimensions are massive, and the annulus area is 800, it's way beyond the TAVR range and they're a surgical candidate, they're gonna go to surgery, obviously. Some of these more nuanced, um, some of these more nuanced scenarios though are folks with an ascending aorta that's 4.5. It doesn't yet meet criteria to have you know, an aortic repair for an aneurysm yet, but um, that's a group of patients that's been excluded from every TAVR trial, and there's a 2A guideline recommendation that if they're, and that's, and that's how we, we practice here. If their aorta is 4.5, and they're a young patient who's gonna, you know, it may not matter if they're 88, again, fundamentals here, that patient, we don't need to worry about their aorta 10 years down the road. But if they're a younger patient with a 10-year prognosis and their ascending aorta is 4.5, they are probably better served with surgery. So Jim, it sounds like it, as long as the aorta is okay and the anatomy for TAVR is okay, you would go towards the TAVR, unless there is a reason not to do a TAVR. Absolutely, absolutely. Some of these other scenarios, but I will tell you that my, I would say 80% of my open surgery cases now are bicuspid valves. So I, yep. I would say that my practice has shifted. I imagine that's the same for the other surgeons in the group. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of uh, very young bicuspid valve patients out there. Um, there. There are some that have pure AR. That's only 10 to 15% of bicuspid valves really present with very little calcification and pure AR or AI. Um, most of these are mixed disease valves. So that's another, uh, another subset of people uh, on the left there who, have, um, who probably benefit from surgery. Strange coronary anomalies with high coronary obstruction risk, we certainly see that more commonly with bicuspid valves. And that is a, 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 re a common reason we would send them uh, uh, to Vino or Jim or Morris for surgery. And then we'll, we'll look at some of these extreme calcification cases and, and extreme aortic valve complex shape deformities where just based on TAVR planning, it doesn't look like a good idea to put a, put a TAVR valve in there. So uh, we can't escape a bicuspid talk without the obligatory um, morphology slide, but um, this is a good starting point when you're thinking about the aortic valve complex and shape. 80 or 90% of bicuspid valves are gonna be the Seavers type one, uh, fusion of a commissure, um, or as described in Jalawi, tricommissural with calcific fusion. Those are, the, those are equivalent terms. Um, those valves generally do well with TAVR. Often, the, the people who are not going to be a great TAVR candidate are these other Seavers 0 or Seavers 2 shaped valves. So when we're first, the first thing, once we've decided we're clinically this TAVR may be reasonable, the first thing we're looking at on the CT is what the morphology of the bicuspid valve is. We are highly suspicious if they're type zero that mm, we better be really careful about deciding, deciding on TAVR. It's, it's not an exclusion, but we just need to be careful about how we're planning the TAVR. Here, here's an example of what I uh, uh, am talking about with this, um, this aortic valve complex shape. And, and rarely, honestly, are we talking about a super elliptical shape, especially the type 1 Seavers valves. The annulus, as you can see in the, the leftmost images, are usually still pretty circular. But it's as, as you move up the annulus or down the annulus, you can have some, some shapes that may be challenging. So for instance, uh, the topmost case, the annulus measures for a 20, you know, the average diameter is 26 millimeters. However, a little bit higher up where the leaflets insert uh, measures only 22. 
um, and even higher up, it's only still 25. So you can imagine, you've got to put a 26 millimeter valve in there to get a seal and to not have torrential paravalvular leak. But if you do that, and uh, the leaflet insertion measures only 22 millimeters, you can, you can imagine a catastrophic, potentially, outcome uh, with annular rupture or uh, avulsion of, of those leaflets. So that's a case that maybe you use a self-expanding valve with, or maybe you send a surgery. So there's just a lot more, uh, a lot more nuance when, when looking at the CTs and planning these TAVR procedures. Um, here's a case of um, extreme calcification. And there are CT criteria Venka alluded to, you know, greater than 3,000 aortic valve calcium score. Um, you, you, that's a lot of calcification. That could be extreme calcification, but I would argue that the distribution and where it sits is even more important. This is a patient that you can imagine a nice uh, cross-sectional picture of the annulus and LVOT probably looks fine. But then when you really dig into looking at the CT a little bit more, and this actually, the valve calcium score on this patient, I looked it up, was only around 1900. So it's just that all of the calcium is just in this one super bulky leaflet. You can see this aortogram. It's almost a space occupying calcium chunk down there in the sinus, just waiting to get pushed through the uh, sinus uh, when we inflate a TAVR valve in it. So this is a case that actually we took off the table um, and went to surgery and Jim operated on the patient and she did fantastic. But it's, it's as much about the distribution of the calcium and its location as it is about the total amount. Anomalous coronaries, again, far more common. Um, here's an example on the left of, uh, and this, this comes up, especially Seaver zero valves, both coronaries come off of one of the sinuses, one of the cusps. You can imagine that right coronary coming off right near the corner where that leaflet's going to get folded up. That's going to be a much higher risk for coronary occlusion than a left main that comes off right at the the, the middle portion of the sinus. So that's one also probably should go to surgery. Uh, the case on the right is one I'm aware of where uh, bicuspid valve uh, left non-fusion and was not recognized that there was an anomalous left circ off the right coronary cusp. And actually, even though the right coronary had perfectly fine height, uh, the circ closed in this case when TAVR was performed. It was able to be recognized and rescued uh, with a stent. But this is one that you just have to be uh, very cognizant of these coronary anomalies with, with bicuspid valves. So in summary, and I'm going to go back to that same slide, um, fundamentals still apply always. Ask the age first, ask about aortopathy first, and then you can get into some of these life planning issues and some of these other more uh, nuanced uh, categories of patients that, that may or may not benefit from, from, from TAVR versus surgery. So. Go ahead. Great.